Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have a great show for you tonight. A couple of uh, uh, people who are lobbying in the Oregon legislature are here tonight. Right next to me, behind me here, is Mr. Anthony Taylor with Compassionate Oregon. And over in the wings, Mr. Caleb Hayes with uh, Oregonians for Public Health and Safety. You got it. That's it. And uh, right next to me is that wild and crazy guy back from a brief hiatus, Mr. Casper Leach. Then over in the wings, I'd like to welcome Mr. John Cornett, ready to play some music. Hey, Are John. you high, John? Yes, sir. I am very Try to good. calm down. Try to calm down, Casper. You're, you're out of control tonight. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, we have uh, some hip news for you, and uh, we'll be back to take your questions in a, a video or two as well. So stay tuned as we bring on our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. I feel the force. All right, tonight's first story is from Colorado. Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper met with Attorney General Jeff Sessions and came away with the feeling that a federal crackdown on states with legalized marijuana is not likely. The Denver Post reported this week. Hickenlooper's Chief of Staff, Doug Friedenash, indicated that Sessions is more focused on other priorities, such as the proposed border wall, than he is with legal marijuana markets. Fried Nash said that Sessions viewed the 2014 Cole Memo as, quote, not too far from a good policy, end quote. The Cole Memo directs the Department of Justice to not interfere in state-sanctioned cannabis programs. Hickenlooper pointed out to, uh, to the Attorney General that since legalization, there's been no rise in teenage cannabis use in the state and that emergency room visits have steadily decreased as officials have enacted laws to better regulate cannabis-infused edibles. Colorado lawmakers backed off a plan earlier this month to legalize cannabis social clubs after Hickenlooper indicated that he did not support the plan due to fears that it could attract federal intervention. Although Hickenlooper received no definite assurances from Sessions during their meeting that the administration would maintain the status quo, it's a promising sign after questions brought about Attorney General Sessions being approved as Donald Trump's Attorney General and the appointment of Tom Marino as head of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Our next story tonight is a horrible story about a Wichita, Kansas grandmother. Angela Kastner, a grandmother from Wichita, Kansas, was sentenced to 48 hours in jail this week for driving under the influence. Even though there was no alcohol in her system, she tested positive for traces of THC that had been metabolized and were inactive in her urine. THC is the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana that causes a high. However, the THC came from Marinol, a synthetic medical marijuana product approved by the FDA and prescribed to Kastner by her doctor to suppress nausea from chemotherapy. She's undergoing chemotherapy for what is likely terminal colorectal cancer. Kansas is one of only three states where medical marijuana remains completely illegal, but marijuana has been legal nationwide since 1985. Kastner was locked up anyway. She said, quote, I miss my chemo tomorrow and I miss my doctor's appointments tomorrow. I feel sorry for the next cancer patient who has to go through anything like I've had to go through. They shouldn't have done this to me at the end of my life." End quote. Next story tonight is from north of the border up in Washington State. On uh, April 20th, the unofficial cannabis holiday, Washington lawmakers voted to ban the use of inflatable tube displays, persons in costumes wearing or holding or spinning a sign with a marijuana-related commercial message, end quote, by retail businesses selling cannabis products. The Washington Marijuana Bill also has a few positive aspects, such as allowing Washington residents to share marijuana with other legal adults for the first time and allowing cannabis retailers to operate five dispensaries instead of just one, as the law had been before. 
Presently, uh, the stated purpose of this prohibition of marijuana promoting blow-up ads is to protect children, of course. Current regulations already prohibit marijuana advertisements from using cartoon characters, toys, or other depictions deemed especially appealing to children or other persons under the legal age to consume marijuana. But Washington legislatures felt that a number of outdoor advertisements from recreational dispensaries were flouting the spirit, if not the letter of the law. Images of a billboard put up by Clear Choice Cannabis in Tacoma were circulated around the Washington legislature as proof of a cannabis business potentially targeting children. It featured a cat wearing a collar along with text saying, I'm so high, right, meow. Uh, it has since been voluntarily removed by the business owner. State Representative Christine Kilduff of uh, a Democrat out of Seattle said, uh, when you have those big billboards out there, for our youth to see, it just telegraphs legitimacy, end quote. An amendment banning billboards was initially proposed, but this was later dialed back after First Amendment concerns were raised. Washington Senate Bill 5131 must be signed by the governor before it becomes law. In Minnesota, the police in the state of Minnesota found approximately 1,100 pounds of marijuana hidden in the trunks of around 22 brand new Ford Fusions manufactured and shipped from Mexico's Ford plant in February and March of this year. The total street value of the marijuana seized is about $1.4 million, according to them. It began in February when St. Paul authorities discovered 80 pounds of marijuana hidden in the spare tire walls of two Fusions already uh, for delivery at a railway vehicle holding lot. The authorities soon learned that cars were part of a larger group of 15 cars, 13 of which had already been delivered to the dealerships. The police tracked down the remaining cars and found 40 to 60 pound bricks of marijuana in the spare tires well of each one. One of the Ford Fusion recovered had already been sold to an 86 year old man. Police in Dilworth, Minnesota later found an additional 275 pounds marijuana and seven more Ford Fusions after railroad employees discovered the drugs during routine inspection. The authorities believe the marijuana was placed in the car by members of the Mexican Sinaloa drug cartel as they were loaded onto train cars for shipment to the United States and that the plan was to have someone break into the railway cars once they reached the U.S. and recover the marijuana to be distributed. In the far north of Great White Alaska, Rainbow Farms Juneau, Alaska's first legal marijuana retailer was turned away uh, last month by the U.S. Postal Service when one of its owners attempted to mail a regularly scheduled tax payment to Anchorage. Anchorage is the only place in the state equipped to take cash deposits. According to the uh, postal inspector Aaron Beeman, he told uh, the Empire News of Anchorage, Alaska that, quote, any proceeds from the selling of marijuana is considered drug proceeds under federal law, so you can't mail that, end quote. Uh, Ken Alper, Alaska Department of Revenue Tax Division Director, said in an interview that the state needs to find a way for these legitimate business people to pay their taxes. We thought we'd done that, and this throws a tremendous wrinkle into our processes, end quote. Even though eight states, Alaska, California, Colorado, Massachusetts, Maine, Nevada, Washington, and right here in Oregon, and of course, ironically, in Washington, D.C., they've legalized recreational marijuana. Cannabis businesses remain mostly locked out of the banking system. Marijuana is still illegally, illegal federally, so any business that deals with it is in violation of federal law. The U.S. Department of Justice stated in a 2013 memo that it would not interfere with states that have legalized marijuana, but the policy could change at any time. Quote, until there's an act through Congress, I understand why the banks are very concerned. Just because the law is not being enforced today does not mean it won't be enforced tomorrow. End quote. Kevin Onslam, Alaska's banking regulator, told the newspaper. The fact that marijuana businesses have to deal in cash only poses security risks. Erica McConnell, director of the Alaska Alcohol and Marijuana Control Office, said no marijuana worker has yet been harmed in Alaska, but criminals have targeted businesses. She said, quote, we're aware that there have been some break-ins, and yeah, that is a concern. I'm not aware of anyone at this point being injured, end quote. Rainbow Farms there in Juneau is the first business to remit marijuana taxes to the state from off the road system, and uh, the problem is in the counters will be soon to be seen by other growers and shops as well. Lacey Wilcox, the Southeast chapter president of the Marijuana 
Industry Association of Alaska said she and other marijuana businesses off the road system are confident that things will get better. She said, quote, we're all rooting for each other and I think collectively we'll get there. The only question is how long is it going to take, end quote. Next story is out of the nation's capital, more specifically Arlington, Virginia. The National District Attorney Association is calling for the federal government to strictly enforce anti-cannabis laws in states that have regulated its production and distribution for either medical or recreational purposes. In a new white paper, the district attorney group recommended that the Trump administration set aside the 2013 Cole Memorandum directing U.S. attorneys not to interfere with state legalization efforts and that those licensed to engage in the plant's tightly regulated production and sale. According to uh, the District Attorney Association's paper, they said, quote, to maintain respect for the rule of law, it is essential that federal drug enforcement regarding the manufacture, importation, possession, use, and distribution of marijuana be applied consistently across the nation, end quote. The National District Attorney Association is the largest and oldest prosecuting, prosecutor's organization in the USA. Out of Lowell, Massachusetts, subjects who consume cannabis are significantly less likely to suffer from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD, as compared to those who do not, according to a population-based case control data published in the journal PLOS One. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is most prevalent form of liver disease in humans, affecting an estimated 80 to 100 million people in the United States. A team of researchers from the University of Massachusetts Medical School and John Hopkins University in Baltimore assessed the relationship between cannabis use and fatty liver disease in a nationally representative cohort of 5.9 million hospitalized patients ages 18 or older. The authors reported that the prevalence of fatty liver disease was 15% lower in occasional marijuana users than it was in non-users. More habitual cannabis consumers were 52% less likely to be diagnosed with the disease as compared to abstainers. The researchers concluded, quote, we observed a strong dose-dependent reduction in the prevalence of fatty liver disease with cannabis use, suggesting that cannabis use might suppress or reverse fatty liver disease development, end quote. Separate case-controlled studies had previously reported an inverse association between cannabis use and obesity and adult-onset diabetes, both of which are risk factors for fatty liver disease. The full text of this study, Cannabis Use is Associated with Reduced Prevalence of Non-Alcoholic Fatty Liver Disease, a cross-sectional study, appears in this month's edition of PLOS One. Our last story tonight is from Vancouver, British Columbia. Cannabis consumption is positively associated with the decreased use of crack cocaine, according to longitudinal data published in the Journal of Addictive Behaviors. Canadian investigators assessed the use patterns of cannabis and crack cocaine in a cohort of 122 subjects over a three-year period. They reported that participants subsequently reduced their frequency of crack cocaine consumption following the intentional use of cannabis. They concluded, quote, in this longitudinal study, we observed that a period of self-reported intentional use of cannabis was associated with subsequent periods of reduced use of crack cocaine. Given the substantial global burden of morbidity and mortality attributable to crack cocaine use disorders alongside a lack of effective pharmacotherapies, we, call, we echo calls for rigorous experimental research on cannabinoids as a potential treatment for crack cocaine use disorders." End quote. These findings replicate those of a smaller Brazilian study reporting that the therapeutic use of cannabis reduced crack cocaine cravings and use patterns in drug-dependent subjects. Separate studies have similarly reported that the use of opioids and rates of opioid-related mortality falls in jurisdictions where marijuana access is legal. Nationwide data also reports a decline in adults' overall use of cocaine at the same time that adults' use of marijuana has risen. This study, Intentional Cannabis Use to Reduce Crack Cocaine Use in a Canadian Setting, a Longitudinal Analysis, appears in this month's edition of Addictive Behaviors. That's the end of our Hemp News segment for tonight, and I think John Cornett's ready to play a song, aren't you, John?
type of stuff, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Isn't it All right, thank you, John. I was informed that we have an audio problem on your microphones over there. For some reason, we have an audio problem on your microphone, so it hasn't been coming through too well. But uh, next time, some you know, we're in a volunteer show. And one of the few times he hit all the keys this time. Hey, right? it strings. sounded they good. Anthony studio. Taylor, it did sound good. Hey, Casper, welcome back. Nice to meet you too, sir. We're just Hello. meeting tonight, Bye. but uh, Paul Loney said good things about you and. You've been working with this organization, uh, Oregonians for Public Health and Safety. It's hard yeah. to be against that. Isn't it, right? Yeah. I think uh, clean cannabis turns out to be something Oregonians care about. That's what we've noticed. And mm -hmm. we're actually really proud to claim that uh, we are the fastest growing cannabis related advocacy group uh, in Oregon right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we think we will continue that growth because Oregonians seriously want clean cannabis. Now, I don't think our viewers understand what you mean by clean cannabis. There are yeah. new rules that have been implemented, wasn't through the legislative process, but through the administrative rulemaking process, right? Well, they're in the middle of that they've process changed, right like, now. Yeah. Six times in the past year, I think. Yeah, we got to a, a pretty de decent place in terms of rules. I'm on not exaggerating. I might maybe five times. Yeah, and we've seen them rolled back four times. Uh, uh -huh. And you know, we kind of think of this as the death blow to testing. Where are we at right now with this, these rules? They don't have to test for pesticides at all? Is that what you're saying? Well, unfortunately, on concentrate products, there wouldn't be any final test required. And that's really concerning because if you think about it, when they concentrate flour, you not only concentrate the THCs, you see the levels go up when you purchase a concentrate rather than a flour, but you're also concentrating any contaminant that may be on it. Right, right. So, and so final testing is very important. So that rule changed effective January 1st, I think. How often has that rule changed since the first of the year? Well, luckily, that rule change has not been implemented yet. This mm -hmm. is simply a proposed rule that mm -hmm. the OHA has on the table right now. The public comment period on that ended April 30th, but there's still opportunity to influence legislators. There's a bill on the table, House Bill 3. 448 that would require 100% testing. Uh, also, the governor kind of has the final say in the executive branch, so uh, she has the opportunity to say no to these bad proposed rules that we feel are really dangerous for Oregonians. I know there's a lot of other ones. I want to introduce Anthony Taylor. You've been down there lobbying for a long time with uh, Compassionate Oregonians. 
Yeah, we've been down there for... Been on this show a half dozen times. <laughs> yes, I have. It's good to be back. Thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> good to see everybody. Um, we're really glad that, um, you know, we have had an opportunity to keep lobbying that long and that, you know, over the years we've uh, gotten quite the seat at the table and uh, get to, uh, you know, really advocate for the patient issues when it comes up. And, uh, you know, everything the industry does affects patients. And uh, we have to keep reminding them of that every time we meet with them. And uh, some of them still hadn't, haven't made the connection, um, as is evident by the, the uh, most recent bill passed by the Marijuana Regulation Committee, Senate Bill 1057. The which Joint is, Committee on Marijuana Regulation. Let's, let's give it proper attribution, right? They're the correct. Joint Committee. The Joint Committee. Yuck, yuck. <clears throat> and some of them they could, pick that name. Some yeah. of them could use one. Yeah. yeah. So I think one of the most scary things I've heard in terms of a medical marijuana patient and a medical marijuana gardener is that they want to, with Senate, is it Senate Bill 1057? That's correct. Senate Bill 1057 would force all medical marijuana growers that have more than two patients to buy the software and track their cannabis from seed to sale. Now, for a person like me, I grow from cuttings. I don't really grow from seed, but from cutting to sale, I, you know, and, and I give away most of mine, so it really wouldn't even be cuttings to sale, it would be mainly cuttings to giving it away, right? So I've got to track that at great expense and report it very frequently. How often under this 1057 rule? Is it a daily, ongoing? It's an ongoing thing. Uh, it's the, so called the metric system. We'd and all, all medical growers would be switched to, away from the Oregon Health Authority, to the Oregon Liquor Control Commission. For and tracking, that's they correct. would be able to come into any medical marijuana grower's garden, whether it be in their home or their basement or in the middle of their bedroom or whatever. They'd be able to come in to that location without a search warrant, without any warning, and, and ascertain that you are, in fact, current, keeping track, have things properly marked. You'd be subject to these inspections by these OLCC regulators, just like you were a bar or a, a, a commercial alcohol establishment. Isn't that yeah. correct? Senate that, Bill 1057 correct. is absolutely big profit in marijuana trying to squeeze out the compassionate people in medical cannabis who give cannabis away to patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what he said. Yeah. Well, so me, I've absolutely given away absolutely over the true. past... Uh, uh, 15 years, I've given away over 500 pounds of free well, marijuana to sick and dying profits, patients sir. every year. Right. Right. Huh? Well, that cuts into no, someone's profits. I guess so. I guess so. And those people want to really regulate me out of being able to do that. I mean, it already cost me about $100,000 a year to be able to do that. Well, a little and they're bit doing more than this that. in other countries, and they've done it quite successfully up in Canada, where they have been now starting to push the uh, local gardeners and the medical gardeners uh, uh, either underground or away and making it so that the, if you're not getting your medicinal cannabis from the government, then you're breaking laws, etc. So uh, they're trying to make that happen in so many different countries, let alone America. Yeah, well, it's really egregious uh, in 1057. And uh, not only are they making you pay to use the tracking system, they're also going to make you pay the administrative costs of administrating the program to make Oregon medical marijuana patients So small track. medical so growers would have to pay the fees to cover the big corporations that want to take all, over this industry this burden, until they're gone. And all this burden, yet in this bill, no opportunity to sell into the recreational market. Right. That bill is being held back in the Marijuana Committee and right now. And that bill limits it to a 20-pound sale. That's right. Which, you know, I sold 20 pounds to the Cannabis Corner. It's the only sale I've had. And that was just $20,000. Well, when something costs you $100,000 a year to do and you bring in $20,000, that's yeah. not... Not a very big... Uh, uh, so they, they no, could have put those a, issues together. It's a it. step in the right direction. But, but 20 it's pounds is way too... I mean, they should, you should be able to sell any excess you have. You shouldn't be limited to how much you can sell into the commercial system if you're going to be held to those rules. You should uh, be able to sell everything into the commercial system that doesn't go directly to your patients. Otherwise, where does it go? Well, right? Anthony is recognizing a sort of a political realities issue here. Well, one uh -huh. of the things that William Nelson pointed out on my show when he was on in 91 was that 10% uh, uh, of all farms... 26 current, years ago. 
currently are owned privately. The rest are owned by corporations, and that was way back then. So uh, that was just your standard farms being uh, cultivated for tomatoes and green beans. Now, this is a multi-trillion dollar crop that can create so much more than green beans and tomatoes ever can. Don't you think that the national corporate chains and the international corporate chains are already figuring out ways to corner out mom and pops? No, I don't. What we are seeing, though, is big moneyed interests in the state of Oregon that are doing that. And they're not, you know, aligned with the huge mega corporations that we see like Monsanto and Bayer controlling everything. But, um, yeah, there's big money in there that's really, really, to your point, pushing out the small people, the small family farmers, the people that are doing compassionate work for patients in this state and need a little help with that by being able to sell some so cannabis into the that, system. Who is it that's pushing this uh, 1057 to force medical growers? Isn't that, what's the group called? The Oregon Cannabis Business? Yeah, OCBC. Oh. Don, Don Morris's group, yeah. OCBC, the yeah. Oregon Cannabis Business Coalition? Yeah, is that it? and they, it's Council. funny, they, they claim that our group is Reefer Madness. Oh, uh, yeah, we're here with you Oregonians today. Oregonians for... Yeah. That's just because we disagree with them on testing and we disagree with them on what they're trying to do to the patient right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they call us reefer madness. So if that's the way it works, you know, if we I, don't, I'm used to that. If we don't stop some of 1057. The opposition says what they do, not what you do. Yeah. If we don't stop some of this stuff that's in 1057, in the bill that we're working on right now that we'll hear on Tuesday, uh, uh, House Bill 2198. And where is that going to be heard? <clears throat> Before the committee. The, the, jo the, joint, the joint committee, committee on, on the Tuesday night. Joint means that it's both senate members and house members that's correct how many members are on the joint committee there's 10 and you have to have a majority from the house side and a majority from the senate side to pass it so you have to have at least three votes on each side to pass a bill out I see. but what will happen if this bill really does come into effect was if somebody is a patient that grows for themselves at an address not their own home it's going to cost you about a thousand or twelve hundred dollars a year to get your medical marijuana card wow so we're going to keep everybody up to date but 1057 is a horrible situation and so there's this fee yeah. for medical growers what is that Caleb? well i just wanted to say 1057 is a very bad bill and i think legislators some of them know it's a bad bill and that's why they didn't offer opportunity for the public to comment on this uh -huh. version of the bill and they also sent it to the floor without sending it to ways and means and it's got a 10 million dollar fiscal impact statement traditionally it's fifty thousand dollars would be the threshold for whether or not a bill needs to go to ways and means but mm -hmm. for some weird reason this bill is getting a special pass they did the same thing in 2015 with Senate or House Bill 3400. They, um, in fact, the the chair, the House chair of the jo the Joint Ways and Means Committee was on the panel, and they wouldn't let him take it to Ways and Means because they feared he would slow it down so much that it wouldn't have time to pass. But this is the second time that in 2015 they su actually suspended the rules in the committee to to pass that bill out. This time they just got permission from the Senate President Peter Courtney and passed it out to the floor. I see. Um, we do take viewer phone calls. If you have a question or comment for our guests or any of us tonight, you can call us that number there on your screen. It's 503-288-4442. And we have a caller. Welcome to the show, caller. Not that line. Let's see. I was told there were a couple of callers. Let's try another line. Welcome to the show, caller. Hey, hi. Thank you so much for the show. And um, thank, thank our guests so much for being there. Good to see you today, Casper. Um, uh, I am disgusted again, you know, with what Salem is doing. Not everybody, but so many. Um, you know, I've been down there. I've seen them. I've seen people that don't know anything about what they're doing, having no, no, no reservation at making all kinds of things and regulations about that, which they know nothing about. I personally, I think we are inundated with laws and regulations. I'm not interested in seeing any more laws and regulations. I'm interested in seeing fees and regulations rolled back. Um, other than what you're talking about, Paul, which is that, you know, we need an answer. We, we need to support the market. We need to support the market for our helping people. You're kind of breaking up here in the studio, but I think we got the gist of that. Let's say if someone wants to oppose 1057 and maybe support uh, what, like Bill 2198, which is yeah. a pretty good bill yeah, that would like that. Uh, help 
farmers sell, medical farmers sell into the commercial market, mm -hmm. that 20 pound limit. I think it shouldn't be limited at all, but it's better than nothing. 2198 also creates an Oregon Cannabis Commission that will take over the administration of the OMMP away from the OHA. Well, you know, ballot measure 80, which I put on the ballot in 2012, would have, wouldn't have ever put it under the Oregon Liquor Control Commission. We would have created an Oregon Cannabis Commission, and that was one of the primary things they attacked us about. The media attacked us about creating an Oregon Cannabis Commission. They claimed that it would be like putting uh, Philip Morris in charge of the tobacco industry. That's what the Oregonian newspaper said it back in 2012. And that was one of the most effective arguments that made us lose narrowly. We got uh, uh, within about 50,000 votes of passing with over 47% of the vote. Well, it, it just exemplifies the old saying that in the at the national level, it takes an idea 25 years to come through and become legislation. In Oregon, it's about 40. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what about, uh, is it House Bill 3448? Yeah, you got it. House yeah. Bill 3448? That's a good bill. That's a real good bill because it would require 100% uh, quality control testing on cannabis products. Mm -hmm. What we've seen happen with the agency, the Oregon Health Authority, is some really odd things, like taking money out of the medical program and giving it to other programs like putting uh, testing on the chopping block. So, you know, we feel like it's important for legislators to act now and tell the agency, no, we're not gonna do 33% testing, we're not gonna do 20% testing, or on concentrates, random testing once a year. No, we're gonna do 100% testing so we know Oregonians are safe because when concentrates are failing at 26% of the time, we need to have 100% quality control testing. So, who, who should they contact to tell uh, the, the, our, their own legislators, obviously, in Salem? Yes, absolutely. I, I would go to the governor on the testing issue, mm -hmm. and then I would mm -hmm. go to your legislator and the marijuana committee members, particularly Representative Ann Leininger, a Democrat from Lake Oswego, and Democrat Jenny Burdick, a Democrat from Southwest Portland. Those two are the co-chairs. A lot of times toward the end of uh, session, power tends to consolidate. Mm -hmm. to the two co-chairs and, and bigger joint committees like this in Ways and Means. So mm -hmm. those two are going to have a lot of say on what happens in the legislative arena around the medical program, but the governor is going to have more of a say on testing. I see. Yeah, definitely call the co-chairs. Uh, there's the Senate Bill 1057 and House Bill 2198 will probably, except for what they might try and pick up, because there's uh, will maybe some of the last bills that come out, but they haven't addressed testing seriously, and they haven't addressed land use issues seriously either. Uh, both are major concerns that should be the kind of issue that gets resolved. I got to the, say, the they, have, they have addressed the testing in one way in 1057, that bad bill. They went ahead and said that you could, you could take testing off the labeling requirements. So, you know how we, some of us look at the label to see, can we trust this lab? You know, do we think they have integrity? Are we going right. to, you know, are we going to believe this test? Well, that could go away with 1057. We have another caller. Welcome to the show, caller. Hi. Hey. I have a question. Is the global cannabis march going to happen in Portland tomorrow? The old march down around... Uh, Pioneer Courthouse Square can't be done this year. We've got it scheduled for next year, but Pioneer Courthouse Square has been closed down for remodeling at this period. I understand there's going to be another march that's taking place uh, in a, a neighborhood in East Portland, but that, I, that's kind of put together at the last moment. All right, thanks. All right, thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. But yeah, our regular march, the Global Marijuana March, isn't happening this year in downtown Portland because the, the square we were working on uh, is being remodeled. So we'll be back at that next year. But uh, I do need to point out that Oregon really is a bit more progressive than many of the other states. I mean, after all, you have no... You never know it by looking at their marijuana legislation. No, but you do have no sales tax here, which people like. You can become a, a citizen... Except on marijuana. You have a sales tax on marijuana. But you can become a citizen in 24 hours. You got euthanasia here. There's a lot of things that happen here in this state that are just You lived in Indiana before yeah. you moved here, what, about eight, ten years ago? Right. And so and uh, it's a lot worse there, I know. Or even uh, there, it's like 
it could ruin your whole life, you know, putting out money for lawyers and getting an ankle bracelet and all that. So there is still a lot of good things to be said about Oregon in that aspect. You're right, they are dragging their feet on things. But one thing I like, too, is that here in Oregon, if I need a police officer, I can call one. Because you're not worried they're going to bust you for Right, in Indiana, if I need a police officer, if somebody's breaking into my house or assault and battery or something, I call the police, they'd show up. They would also arrest me for having a pipe on the property for pedal paraphernalia, for having marijuana on the property, right. for having a, not, and then they'd even toss in selling as, as an idea for other Well, you know, that's and, the way it was here and just on top a couple of one years or the ago. Other, and then, so. so it's better just to be robbed in Indiana. So here, <laughs> you know, it, you, can, you can actually call the police if you need them. So, and, and medical patients can get their medical marijuana without being arrested in this state so that's also a good thing so there are things that we do overlook we can contact our legislators to try to stop the bad things but we do need better you're right we need you know, better handling I, of it i went into the legislature when i first came to oregon back in 1985 i moved here in 84 the first legislative session was 85 i was just a youngster 24 years old i may be about your age i don't know caleb but uh that's a long time ago back in 1985 but uh, I went to the legislature and they put up these points of the bill on the board and I stood up and I said, I don't like that one, that one, and that one. And so the chair stood up and he erased them off the board and they were gone just because I stood up and said they should be gone. Now, things have changed since 1985, obviously. Things are a lot more that efficient. That was 1885? <laughs> anyway, uh, after saying that, I wanted to tell our viewers that we have a little video with uh, the strain hunters. The strain hunters are a group of people uh, and a, a series that's appeared on the internet and on Vice TV. A uh, couple of folks from Amsterdam with the Greenhouse Seed Company, Arjun Roskam and uh, Franco Loja, uh, have gone around and created these videos by going to various places around the world, like Jamaica and India and Nepal, and sought out the local genetics so they could take it back to their greenhouse stores and gardens in Amsterdam and create new strains and, and help spread those strains and genetics around the world. So they have this TV series called Strain Hunters. And I first met Arjun and Franco at Expo Grow in San Sebastian, Spain, back when I spoke there in September of 2013, and I shared uh, the podium with him. Here, here's the podium there. If Franco the passed second, away. Second, yeah, I, I'm going to get January. there, Casper. You, right. you blew my thing here. You're right. But uh, here, are, here I am. In fact, that's me at the podium. There's Franco Loja uh, uh, closest to me. Then Arjun Roskam, and then right next to him is the drug czar for Uruguay. <laughs> so this was a thing in Spain, but I have met Franco and Arjun at, at a lot of other things in Chile and in Uruguay and most recently in December down in uh, Medellin, Colombia at the Expo Mediweed. So I saw them in early December and on January 2nd, Franco Roja passed away. He uh, had gone to uh, Central Africa, to the Congo, and uh, for a second time, uh, explored the cannabis market in the Congo and he contracted malaria and though he's a relatively young man in his early 40s uh, the malaria was very virulent he went back to uh, receive treatment in Spain and he passed away on January 2nd so here is a video from the strain hunter series uh, in Jamaica and we'll be right back after this video Never keep track of how long we keep, we keep, we keep yeah. the first seeds. seeds from Amsterdam when did they came in this area the first real high grade, which year we're talking about? 1990 or 95? Or? Mm, no, so no, yeah, yeah, no, so long. Not, Not so, so long. long. New Woolly Man, fresh in Yeah. Yeah, man, it's a new strain. I just say, where you say it come from? So, which you used to use before that strain? Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Cut out, man. Hey, I guess. The real purple, eh? This is one we have two really, really special plants in, eh? There you have a cross with the purple. Yeah. And you don't see often purple anymore like he does here. Yeah. But this is really white widow with yeah. the purple on it. Yeah. It's incredible. It's like 15% purple in this field. Like one on six, one on seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. at least. Mix. All Mix, all eh? All over How many years you have purple? I'm just coming out of business because I like it purple. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so a long it. time you have them. So when we are breeding string, yeah. we select them. Yes. We select for purple. Yes. Respect, dude. <laughs>
Full bright pink hair. So you see how, yeah. how, how intense that purple is? It's incredible. It's neon. Neon. Purple. Oh, like pink. You guys neon. call it pink? Yes. Nah, it's purple. No, it's it's a maroon. Man. This it's one is like purple, maroon. but it's, it's light purple. Okay, it's fluo. It looks like a more fluorescent pink. It's fluo. I just love the smell. And the right resin right. already on this one is ready. This one is finished. Wh which, which area are we now? Muckle pin. Muckle pin. Muckle pin. Right. Yeah, this is the, this is the site of the most wanted. Yeah, most wanted. Most wanted. Most That's most wanted. famous because yeah. even in St. Vincent, you remember that little place? You yeah, see we were in St. Vincent. We in Amsterdam, we have the posters yeah. called Most Wanted. Yeah. You see all different yeah. strains yeah. on yeah. it. But, well, they have, they, have, they have a good strain of water still. They have the same thing with the orange water truck. They have the OC anyway. Buy water from the water truck, same way. Yeah. Yeah. See, when it was coming up, we see also a big pipe also. A yeah. big yeah. pipeline. So you yeah. know the water system sure. more better. Yeah. Sure. Now it's coming. When you drive up here, your car stay like this coming up. So they really up on a high climb. Okay, that was an excerpt from Strain Hunters. Franco Loja just passed away, the, one of the gentlemen there, and he had, they'd given us those videos uh, and told us we can use them here on the show back in, in Spain several years ago. So we appreciate that and have utmost respect for Franco. He went around the world, found a lot of cannabis strains, and introduced them to the international community as uh, uh, his partner, Arjun Roskin, at Greenhouse Seeds in Amsterdam continues to do. So uh, we have a caller on the line, though, I believe. Let's take that call. Welcome to the show, caller. So sorry to hear about that. Yeah, it's, it's very tragic. You know, this young man who'd done so much, lived a very exciting life, flew hundreds of thousands of miles every year around the world. Uh, you know, I saw him in uh, Colombia just in early December, and a month later he was dead from malaria. It was, that, was that in a... Uh where you went to a uh, medical... Um... No, he didn't get it in Colombia. He actually got it in, in Central Africa, in the Congo. Mm -hmm. So he was in Colombia, he went to Argentina, and then Chile, and then back to Amsterdam, and then he went to, Col to Central Africa and within that month. And then he went back very ill to Europe and, and tried to get the best medical care possible. Died well, let's hope that let's hospital. hope that he enjoyed and had a wonderful time at his travels. He definitely did. He was a good man. Right on. Hey, Paul, I just like called like you were talking about '85 and talking to the legislature, and I'm remembering when they we used to have to import all the hemp. And I don't know if you remember Reed Connie. Sure, I do. <laughs> in, in, in uh, Coburg, but yeah. uh, how things have changed. They definitely have. That's one thing you can count on, right? Things are going to change. Yeah, now we have to fight against them making bad rules. <laughs> you know, I remember when we were working on the legalization in 2012 and 2014, people said, hey, you've accomplished your goal when we passed Measure 91. And I told them, oh, there's many battles to come. You can, you want, we want a big one in legalizing cannabis. but uh, it, it, will never, it will never end, Paul, just like all the other. Well, let me put it this way, bullshit. Anyway, um, Paul, hey, have a good night. All right. Do you remember Thanks. William Condy? And, sure, you know I do. I remember doing? William Condy in his lumber yard there, the High Five yeah. Arena right on I-5. Sure. Yeah, in Belize yeah. now. Cobra. Yeah, he's, he's been in Belize for some time. Yep. Yeah, I heard he, he was uh, down south for a long, long time ago. And I yeah, just, he's still I down wondering. in Belize and yeah, occasionally pops up with some, some hemp products and things. Yep. Hey, Paul, thanks for um, talking to everybody, and you all, right. all have a good night. Thank Thanks you for much. your call. We have a few things here tonight. Of course, we have our hemp flame for freedom. This is hemp seed oil with a hemp wick. This is the reason that marijuana is illegal because the petrochemical, pharmaceutical, military, industrial, transnational, corporate elite, fascist sons of a bitches don't want us to drive our cars on this, which any farmer can grow and get hundreds of gallons per acre. They'd rather us drill it out of the earth for millions and billions of dollars to turn it into to products so most of us can't compete. This is why it's illegal and when marijuana is truly restored it will be available as a fuel oil and the primary source of biodiesel fuel. This is some 
hemp oil here. Right here is some uh, uh, cannabis honey that I got in a mail order out of California. It says it's 25 milligrams of THC per ounce of honey. And this is an eight ounce jar of honey. So actually that ounce would be more than a legal dose under Oregon's recreational law. I think they can only sell 15 milligrams of cannabis in a dose for adults and up to 100 milligrams of cannabis for a medical product. Right next to it we have a sharpened dome cannabis bottle from 1910. This is a cannabis extract. This bottle is empty but this other one right here from Merrick Company or the Merrill Company it is actually about two-thirds of the way full and that's pretty pretty nifty there this one is from 1890 by the way about 125 years old and then last but not least we have a little block of cannabis that you're supposed to put into alcohol and then put this package into a quart of alcohol and then take a tablespoon of that and that would be a dose of cannabis from this uh, 1880 product from uh, Sharp and Dome, again, out of Baltimore. You know, that's one our show and tell that segment. we should uh, add to this as a footnote is that from about the 1890s to the 1920s, the American Pharmacological Society and the doctors were some of the best tincture and oil makers in the world. And uh, when the pharmaceuticals came in and we started, you know, finding the magic pill for everything, uh, what all our of that late great friend Todd McCurria called the monomolecular madness, mercantile madness. Monomolecular <laughs> mercantile madness is what Dr. Todd McCurria called it. He was one of the, the, he was the first medical marijuana doctor in the modern age. He passed away from brain cancer about 10 years ago. Yep, I'm going to miss him a lot. Well, the bright brains there in Silicon Valley tell us that within an the decade we'll be able to live forever. We can upload our memories and our brains into a, a, a model that looks like us and have a little robot kind of like us. And we can just live, as long as you got a job and a paycheck, it'll be a good thing. So well, hey, maybe we, if we can live feds, forever. If the feds back off and take cannabis off schedule one, we can study it and maybe it will do all those things. Well, and then the cool? federal government has the patent on it for both uh, cancer treatment and pain relief so well, on one hand the federal government says in the DEA says it's schedule one with no medicinal use whatsoever right. on the other hand health and human services patented it about a dozen years ago for as a cancer treatment and so it's just that Isn't that, that an dichotomy amazing contradiction that just, yeah to say the huh. least to say the least would our government do that so yes, yes, we wanted to one of the things you had raised caleb was the oversight committee and the legislature's inability to provide any funding for the oversight that's needed you want to discuss that oh yeah absolutely well it's one of the big problems we as labs are seeing right now is the lack of oversight I mean, we have orlap but unfortunately like a lot of government agencies they're underfunded uh, and they're not able to get the credible experts they need, particularly in the area of pesticides, uh, to you know, sufficiently oversee the labs. And so what we are very nervous about is the fact that accreditation basically comes once a year. So as soon as the a lab is accredited, if they would like to lower their standards, and we've seen that happen in Oregon before, they can essentially for a year until the next accreditation so we'd like to close that that little gap there uh, make sure that orlap has the necessary experts that they need to oversee us that way labs with integrity flourish and labs that do not have integrity are no longer in the marketplace I see. so anthony what are some priorities for compassionate oregonians uh well, right now we're trying to put together the final touches on House Bill 2198. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and you want to describe what that one will do for our viewers again? The sure. The first thing it does is create the Oregon Cannabis Commission to oversee the administration of the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program. It will have rulemaking authority in a new sense. They don't it's tricky with an agency and a commission in the agency but if the commission has to report back to the legislature on stuff and that's something that hasn't happened ever so there's been no accountability for the program for so even though it's been in place since 1999 nobody's come to the legislature to report on it this new commission will be required to do that it'll also be required to uh, develop and implement a long-term 
uh, strategic plan to make sure that cannabis remains a viable option for uh, medical marijuana patients. And the final thing it does is... Well, if I could add something, Anthony, you Go think ahead. of it, Will, I say this about the bill. Uh, and this is... Is it House Bill or Senate Bill 2198? House Bill, House Bill 2198. 98. Uh, it allows the commission to set up what we really need, which is a special committee on testing and this that is can a new analyze Oregon cannabis commission. That's yeah. right, and allows them to set up a special committee that we really need that can analyze what needs to be on the list and at what level it needs to be on the list. That way, growers aren't confused because right now it's a confusing world for a grower. I'll tell you. I saw a list that came out that had a bunch of natural controls that I had been using, like mm -hmm. neem oil. Now, I don't want neem oil on my buds. It makes it taste bad. But uh, uh, it's kind of discouraging use of these organic controls. And like I said, uh, it's a confusing world. Green Clean, world. which is a uh, bacteria that eats mold and, and mildew and stuff. Well, so. That's why we advocate for a standing committee that can look at these things with the experts on it and take a look at these things and get us answers that actually make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw sunflower seed that. oil was something that you're, again, I don't want to smoke or vaporize sunflower seed oil, but still, uh, it's not something that's toxic. There's no doubt about that. We well, think sunflower seed oil works. Hemp oil must certainly work. Yeah, yeah. Good point. <laughs> Good point. So, so we want to contact our legislators and tell them to oppose Senate Bill 1057, support House Bill 2198, yes. and it's House Bill 3448. Yes, that's right. So we want to support 2198 and 3448, both of them House bills, yep. and oppose Senate Bill 1057. And are all of those before the Joint Committee on Marijuana Regulation? Well, unfortunately, 1057 has already passed through. Passed and I, I got to say, it was, it was truly remarkable that it passed through on a split vote. Uh -huh. Now, in a lot of committees, you'll see a four or five or that kind of thing all the time with split between Democrats and Republicans. But historically, and correct me if I'm wrong, Anthony, we've actually never seen a, a split vote out of the marijuana committee. I see. I see. Yeah, and what like do you attribute that to, the influence of the Oregon Cannabis Business Council, or was there something else involved there? That may be part of it. I think part of it is, is also just courageous legislators like Representative Carl Wilson, uh, Senator Jeff Cruz, mm -hmm. and uh, Senator Floyd Przanski, uh, who took a stand when they saw something uh, coming through that wasn't right. They took a stand and they voted no on it. So mm -hmm. I think it has to do more with the courage of those legislators than anything else. Mm -hmm. What would you say, Tony? Well, I would say that, you know, uh, the good thing is that 1057 is a result of the bill they initially tried to do, which was gut and stuff 2198, and bring in the whole OLCC matrix and merge the two systems together. Mm -hmm. That's what they were trying to do. 1057 is a result of that, and um, it's still a bad bill. There's a couple of good things like um, trade show exhibition of cannabis, um, one of uh, Caleb's favorite, a the Department of Ag can now test. Um, a couple other technical fixes, but there's some really bad stuff there, like they've restricted the amount of marijuana that can be dr grown at a house to six plants recreational and four plants, I'm sorry, four plants recreational, six plants medical, no matter so how many people six. or patients live there. Down from 16. Yeah, so that, uh, that's which bill? 1057. 1057. So we really bill. have to now, on 1057, call members of the Senate and members of the House and tell them not only is it a bad bill, it came out of committee without a fiscal Do you folks know the number reason. or how to tell our viewers how who to contact? You can go to OregonLegislature.gov. They have a feature that allows you to find your legislator. But while you're at it, I would say, you know, reach out to the governor uh, and uh, reach out to the co-chairs. If, if you're an expert on the issue, they still want to hear from you. And they should recognize that limiting the plants, f especially for the medical patients, is a lot like saying, well, if you're a diabetic and I'm a diabetic and we end up being roommates, we use a medication that one diabetic can use. Right. And that's not fair because somebody's going to end up sick, really, really sick that way. So, Anthony Taylor, we're down to less than three minutes here. If somebody wants to contact Compassionate Oregonians, your organization, where should they go? CompassionateOregon.org compassionate or our Oregon. Compassionate Oregon Facebook page. So CompassionateOregon.org yep. or your Facebook page. Yep. 
Caleb Hayes, what is the best way to reach uh, Oregonians for public health and safety? What a great name. How can Thank you be you. against that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, like I said, everybody's for clean cannabis, free of contaminants. We're on Facebook. Oregonians for public health and safety is the name. Uh, we're on Twitter, OR Public Health, and uh, we're on uh, in the, the World Wide Web with the website at orpublichealth.com. Again, that's orpublichealth.com. We'd love to hear from you. We'd also love it if you'd be willing to join the organization, uh, chip in uh, any amount you can every month to help support clean cannabis. We'll even send you an awesome Keep Cannabis Clean rally sign if you sign up. So. And Casper, you want to tell everyone about your radio shows and the internet? Please make it a point to go to Time for Hemp dot com time hyphen for hyphen hemp dot com both urls will take you to a great place where you can listen to all cannabis all the time 24 hours a day seven days a week live stream also our archives are filled with great programs that have been produced and released by many hosts on our network so please make it a point to share us with your friends that's time for hemp dot com and paul i'm not used to giving a a plug like that so thank you so much <laughs> Only every week, but that's okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, if you're interested, I, we, of course, are telling you now, do not visit the old clinic that a bunch of Canadian uh, and an Israeli drilling company called Adira Energy have taken over our clinic on 18th Avenue. So don't go there. If you want to reach us and ask us any questions, you can call us at 503-235-4606. That's 503 503- Two three five four six zero six. If you're outside of the Portland area, you can call us at 888-499-THCF. That's 888-499-8423. Want to thank you for watching. John Cornett's got a 30 seconds of music. Tune in next week and help us restore hemp. Ah.